As a recovering perfectionist, I think something that's really helped me is this mantra of good is good enough. And that doesn't mean settling. That doesn't mean doing something half-assed or subpar. But it means sometimes it's better to release something into the world without revising and revamping and going over and over again and, and putting yourself out there because we can spend so much time trying to perfect ourselves or perfect something and then we miss opportunities. Hey my friends, this is Nishant and welcome to the Nishant Garg Show. This is a podcast about helping you live a fulfilled life. And the mission of the show is to spread mindfulness awareness. And my job on the show is to invite world-class experts to extract the practices, routines, and habits to help you live a fulfilled and abundant life. Today's guest is Simone. Simone graduated from the University of Florida with a bachelor's degree in finance and concentration in spirituality and health. At the beginning of her academic journey, Simone struggled with her mental health and emotional well-being. It wasn't until her junior year when she faithfully stumbled upon a credit-bearing course in mindfulness that she went from surviving in college to thriving. Her own struggles as an undergraduate student drives her passion and mission to effectuate positive change within the mental health landscape on college campuses and to the realization of Youth Thrive Education Services. Simone received her master's degree in clinical psychology in education with an emphasis on mind-body medicine and graduating at the top of her class. Simone lives in Arizona with her husband and has a love for traveling, being active, hiking and spending quality time with family and friends. Without further ado, please enjoy this wide-ranging conversation with Simone. Simone, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Nishant. I'm very grateful to be here today. It's my pleasure. So before we recorded this podcast, you mentioned that you would like to walk us through a mindful moment. Can we do that? Yes, I would love that. This is something that my team and I, we start all our meetings our internal meetings with a mindful moment. And so I thought it might be a nice way for us to kind of shift into our time together. And if the listeners want to participate, that's great. But I figured that we could just take a few deep breaths together, slowing down the breath. The breath is a gift that happens unconsciously, automatically every second of every day, and it can be used as a really wonderful tool to help calm the body, calm the, calm the mind, and bring us into the present moment. And so I would love to cue us through three deep breaths together. So we can inhale and exhale. Breath two, inhale, and exhale, and last time, inhale, and exhale. Thank you for allowing me to start our time in that way. Sure. How did you start your mindfulness journey? Well, I almost can't even remember life without mindfulness, to be quite honest. I, I feel very fortunate. I grew up in a household where both my parents meditated when I was about 10. They had a midlife crisis and went on some journey together and came home. And I don't know what happened <laughs> when they were away, but they were deeply impacted by mindfulness and meditation. They'd never been exposed to it before, and it just became a natural part of their day. And so I grew up seeing both my parents start their day meditating, sometimes twice a day, 
it was a running joke whenever I would have friends over, <laughs> they would always be like, oh, there's your mom <laughs> meditating. And, you know, my parents never forced that upon me. I kind of came to mindfulness and meditation on my own journey, but it definitely planted a seed and impacted me in many ways. I remember meditating, not even really knowing what I was doing, but before I took the SATs in high school. And it wasn't really until college that I found my own mindfulness and meditation practice that really resonated with me. But it started with my family. What kind of meditation your parents did? So they really primarily did just breath meditation, guided meditation, some mantra-based meditation. So it really wasn't anything specific, although I would say that it was more mindful-based in nature, whether it was doing a body scan or, again, focusing on the breath, lying down seated. So I was exposed to kind of a variety of different tools and, and practices that they each had and still have. They still meditate every single day <laughs> to this day. You mentioned that you started meditation in your high school. What kind of meditation you started with? So I would say I had no idea what I was doing. And I think even to this day, there's this misconception that meditation <laughs> <laughs> needs to be done in a particular way. And a lot of people don't really give it a shot because they think they're doing it wrong, right? My mind needs to be quiet and, you know, oh, I'm going to fall asleep or, you know, I'm thinking about lunch or what have you. And I think I was one of those people where I thought I wasn't really good at it. So I never really did it on a consistent basis. And so in high school, I kind of just, you know, would close my eyes, maybe take a few breaths and call it a day. And that, that worked for me at the time. And it wasn't until I kind of went off to college and I took a credit bearing course in mindfulness called mindful living. And this was before mindfulness was even a buzzword. And before there was this focus on the whole student, which higher education fortunately is moving in that direction. But that's really where I got exposed to a variety of different types of meditations and began to really have a consistent practice myself. You started meditation at a very young age. So what kind of changes or positive impact did you see in your life? That's the a time? great question. Yeah. You know, for me, I think the biggest changes occur off the cushion, so to speak. I have found, and hopefully this doesn't sound too woo-woo, but most major life decisions, and I, I call them inflection points in my life, have been guided after a meditation. It's not one of those things where I'm sitting, meditating, and all these answers come to me, but I have found there is a direct correlation between times where my meditation practice is really strong and the guidance and clarity that I have with respect to the direction of my life and those times where maybe I'm a little more disconnected from my practice and, and how things are unfolding that way. There, there is definitely a clear difference. I, I feel like for me, clarity, direction, patience, and just this present moment of awareness of going through the day and really trying to be mindful of noticing things. So it's really affected me in a very profound and positive way. Could you give us an example or any instance that comes to your mind that had the major positive impact or you were able to take great decisions in that area through your meditation? Yeah, I think with the decision to not pursue a career in finance and to go into the health wow. and wellness industry, that is definitely the biggest realization that I had as a result of my meditation practice, the clarity that I was able to kind of have. I'm happy to share a little bit about Please. that journey. So I thought that I wanted to, I, I majored in finance. I went to the University of Florida, go Gators. <laughs> and um, 
I, I majored in finance, but I received a concentration in spirituality and health. And I landed my dream summer internship with JP Morgan. And that is all I wanted to do. I wanted to go into private banking and I received this, this coveted position in, in Palm Beach. And I knew that if I worked really hard that summer, that the chances of it leading to a job offer, a permanent position upon graduating college would be very high. And so I I did just that. I worked really hard. I excelled and I was offered that job opportunity and I turned it down because I realized that that was not what I was meant to be doing. And I remember distinctly saying to my dad at the time, how long do I have to do this before I can do what I really want to do in life? And I knew that was not a way to start a career. And so I turned down a job opportunity that was going to pay very good money and really just went back to the drawing board. And I did not know, did I want to, all I knew was I wanted to really help people. I wanted to, I was embarking on the spiritual journey for several years at that time. And I really wanted to incorporate my entrepreneurial business sense and mind with my love and passion for mindfulness and and spirituality and sharing those benefits with others. And it came to me in a, after a meditation that I should reach out to the founder of Canyon Ranch. I should reach out to Canyon Ranch, which is a health and wellness resort in Tucson, Arizona. I really only knew of it as a spa in Miami because I had some girlfriends that would go there with their um, moms. And little did I know that they were well beyond just a spa. Again, I don't really know why that kind of came to me, but it did. And that is kind of how I made my shift into entering into the health and wellness industry. So many things that I want to ask you here. So when you reached out to the founder of Canyon Ranch, what did you write to him or her? (laughs) Yeah, so I wrote an email and I had found his email address by, I think it was on like the fourth page of Google on the, uh, a, a reference letter from a former employee. There was his email address. And I sent him an email just really asking him if I could pick his brain on how to get into this industry. I said, I want to incorporate my business mind with my passion for spirituality, and how do I even get into an industry like this? And I'll never forget, I got a reply within like 30 seconds, and I was like so excited. And then I only to come and find that it was like an auto reply that he had gotten a new email address. And uh, at least it gave me the, the new correct email address. And I, I did reach out to, to him. And he, not in 30 seconds, but he replied, you know, within several hours, intrigued and, and wanting wanting to know more about what did I mean by incorporating my entrepreneurial mind with my passion for spirituality. And so I wrote him back a whole essay on how I got into this world and the benefits that, you know, spirituality and mindfulness have had on on my life and that I want to make that my career. Would you mind sharing his name? Yes. His name is Mel Zuckerman. And he is still to this day, I no longer work at Canyon Ranch, but he is not just a mentor to me. He's like a grandfather figure. We definitely have a very, we're kindred spirits, I should say. And I moved out to Tucson. So really what what happened just to, you know, the long or the short of it is he invited me out to Canyon Ranch during my winter break of my senior year. And he invited me to stay on the property with a guest and I brought my dad and we went out there and I said, this is where I want to be. This is what I want to do. 
I will work for free just to get the lay of the land. You know, that was just what I shared in terms of how passionate I was about working at this health and wellness resort. And at the time, there wasn't a position open for me. But, you know, he said, look, we're going to make this work. And I started out as an intern. I, you know, turned down that job and started out just really kind of at the bottom and just wanting to be a sponge and learn everything that I possibly could. And so I was brought on to help grow their spirituality department and to create spiritual programming. And I moved, I picked up, I'm, you know, I went to school in Florida, but I'm originally from New Jersey. And so I picked up and I moved out to Tucson, Arizona without knowing a single person in Arizona, let alone the entire West Coast, and started my career there. (laughs) I'm curious to ask you, what did you personally learn while working there? Oh, wow. I mean, that is such a loaded question because I, I learned so much. I was very fortunate to have been afforded the opportunity to serve in several different roles there, some leadership roles as a young individual managing people. I had worked my way up. And I think what I really learned, especially from Mel, is when you have a vision and you have a passion, that will help see through everything else. And when you know in your heart and you feel that something is right and you do it with conviction, that that is one of the most meaningful and positive things that you can ever embark on and having that that mm-hmm. sense of conviction to go after it. Could you please give us an example of anything that you learned from there and you applied into you're after Canyon Ranch life. Yeah. So I think for me specifically, you know, I was exposed to so many renowned experts in nutrition, in exercise physiology, in spirituality. So it's really hard to pinpoint one specific thing. But what I will say is that being in an environment like that, that puts such an emphasis on helping people make changes in their lives and incorporate wellness on a daily basis. Like I was just surrounded by individuals that I learned different practices and things that I still use to this day, right? Like things such as mindfully walking, right? So we are on this huge property, right? It was a very spread out property that, you know, between meetings, I would be Mm -hmm. walking across a campus and being afforded the opportunity from one of my bosses where we would take mindful walks and we would really focus on, you know, using mindfulness as a tool to stimulate creativity and productive conversations. And so that's something that I still, to this day, I go on a walk almost every day, even <laughs> even living in Arizona. And it's been one of the hottest summers I've ever experienced since living here. You know, we've been having record high <laughs> temperatures. I think today was 104. Yesterday was 107. I still make it a point. I get up early. I go on a walk. And, and I think for me, right something that I really learned is, is the power of walking and movement that it can have on your creativity. How many minutes do you go for a walk? It depends on what day it is and how many meetings I have, but I have a loop in my neighborhood that takes about 30 minutes. There's a 30 minute loop and a 45 minute loop. And I typically do the the 30 minute loop because I can commit to that. To me, that's a, a good amount of time. It still allows time for some of my other self-care practices because I really start off my morning with a whole routine and that is just one element of it. But I'm also not rigid, right? If I'm not feeling, I listen to my body. I think that's one of the the biggest things sometimes when we are engaging in self-care is really doing it from an intuitive aspect and making sure that it feels in alignment for us today, right? What worked for us yesterday and what will work for us tomorrow might not work for us today. 
So I'd say the goal is to do the 30 minute loop every day, but I don't force myself if I'm not feeling up to it for whatever. Yeah, self care should not be stressful. Exactly. Now, how would your dad describe what do you do for a living? Well, I think he would describe it in the same exact way that I would, which is I provide <laughs> programs for college students rooted in mindfulness, positive psychology, and self-compassion that are designed to help college students manage stress and become more resilient and really thrive throughout their undergraduate experience and beyond. We will come back to this thing in a while. And before we go further, I would love to ask you that you mentioned mindfulness and spirituality many times. What is the correlation between mindfulness and spirituality according to you? Mm. Yeah, you know, it's funny. As I was saying that, I was thinking about that because spirituality can mean so many different things for different people and it can conjure up certain images or feelings. And for me, mindfulness is my form of spirituality, right? So, or one of my forms, I should say, right? So for some people, they equate spirituality with religion. For others, it's, you know, more secular. But for me, at the end of the day, what spirituality is, it's connecting with something larger than yourself, right? Whether that's finding spirituality in nature or in the universe or in a, a particular faith, right? So I think mindfulness is one of the tools that helps me deepen my spiritual practices, if that's, if I can put it that way, I guess. Yes. You mentioned that you have meditation, mindful walking. Is there any other tool in your mindfulness toolbox? Yeah, so what we started this lovely session together doing is mindful breathing, right? I think the breath, it's something that it happens if we're breathing, we're living, right? It happens every second of every day. And we just go through the day and we don't even know that we're breathing. We don't even pay attention. And so I really try to take several mindful breaths several times throughout the day. In my ideal world, I would do it every hour, but you know that doesn't happen all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a formal seated meditation practice. For me, it's like brushing my teeth. That's the, where I'm at with my, my meditation. It, it, it has such profound um, impacts that it, 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 for me, it's second nature. It is equivalent to doing something like brushing my teeth. It's second nature. And let me see. I would say that my husband and I, we really do try to mindfully communicate. So bringing a curious mind to conversations that we have to have, whether they are difficult or just any conversation, you know, to be honest, and bringing a certain level of awareness and presence, right? Not being on our phones, being with each other, really listening to what the other person has to say. And I think those are pretty much the main ways I try to infuse mindfulness in my life, right? I think it's something that I try to incorporate throughout the day. Yes, I do have a formal practice that I think enhances my ability to be mindful throughout the day, but really mindfulness is something that we can do. You know, it's at our disposal, at our fingertips. We can practice it throughout the day. There's no tools that are required. Yes. What time of the day do you practice sit in meditation? It has to be first thing in the morning for me. If it doesn't happen first thing in the morning, <laughs> it doesn't happen. No matter how many times I say to myself, I'm just going to do the laundry or do this or do that and then go and meditate, it, it just doesn't happen. But for me, I know this might sound odd and a lot of people when I say this, they're like, shouldn't you do it the other way around? I actually typically have my coffee before I meditate. And the reason being simply because that's my husband and my time together in the morning. We enjoy a cup of coffee together. We sit out on the patio. And, you know, if I miss that window of opportunity, I won't get it again. And I like starting my day that way. So I typically have my cup of coffee. And then right after that, I move into a kind of like a, a moving 
meditation to kind of get some energy through the body. And then I tend to move into my seated practice. And mind you, I don't practice the same thing all the time. I kind of go through phases of what type of meditation I'm doing. And I think that's the real, really neat thing about it is that there's so many different options out there that if you haven't found one that resonates with you, keep trying. And it doesn't need to be something as formal as I do, like a seated practice. While there are benefits to that, there's so many other ways to infuse meditation and mindfulness in your life. I'm visualizing. So your first thing in the morning is coffee, then mindful walking, and then seated meditation. What? We forgot the stretching. I I didn't mention that. I wake up. I stretch because I I'm very physically active. So and I'm feeling it. The older I get, the more I feel that if I don't stretch. It, it doesn't work out that well for me. So <laughs> I wake up, I stretch, I have my coffee, I meditate, and then I start my, my day. And then I go on a walk, and then I start my day. So how many minutes do you spend in your morning ritual? Ooh, so I am a sloth. Like I move at a glacial pace in the morning, right? <laughs> like I'm actually a real energizer bunny. I am a morning person, but I think I'm moving so fast and just like that, like two hours go by. So I would say my my practice from start to finish is about two hours. And I get up really early. I get up at five or 5.30 every day to enjoy that, that quiet time to segue into the day. So yeah, I, I would say that is probably not the norm. Again, like you don't, (laughs) you don't need to spend that much time, but it's something that really, it really sets the tone for how the rest of my day is going to unfold. You have been practicing mindfulness since you were in high school. So that is why you are able to do this much. If somebody who is starting new, they don't have to spend two hours. You can even just do it for five minutes. Exactly. A hundred percent right. I couldn't agree with you more. What's your favorite coffee brand that you drink in the morning? Oh, so we, we're on this kick. So I used to drink, oh my God, my, my husband, he really made fun of me. Not like there's anything wrong with this, but I would just put so much added stuff into my, my coffee. <laughs> and he just didn't understand because he's always been a lover of just drinking black coffee. And I said, oh my God, I don't think I could ever do that. And the past, I don't know how many months, I probably since quarantine, to be honest, I don't know what possessed me to, <laughs> to try this or embark on this, but like he, that's one of his mindful rituals. He makes us, you know, a beautiful French pressed coffee every day. So we are really big on trying a lot of local coffees here in Tucson. I just was in Sedona a few weeks ago. And so we brought back some different coffees there. So that's something that we've actually enjoyed is switching it up and not typically drinking the same coffee. But if there was one brand that I did drink very consistently for a while, it's a brand, I'm not sure if you've heard of it. It's called Bulletproof Coffee. I'm not... It's, it's really wonderful. It's very, you know, it's organic. It has very few mycotoxins. That's something that they really, you know, it's sourced really well. And that's really important to me is where my food and things are coming from and what I'm putting in my body. And so that's why I, I particularly chose that brand. But yes, right now we are in a phase of just trying any type of new coffee, particularly those that are local to Tucson or, or Arizona. Got it. And now I would love to shift some gears and would love you to talk about your mission, which is You Thrive Education yes. Services. Could you speak to that, please? Yes. So I think it's important to provide a little bit of context as to how I even got started with my my business, which I shared a little while ago, right? We provide programs to college students to really kind of help them deal with the trials and tribulations that are just a natural part of that phase of life, right? The first time for many where they're independent and going off on their own. And this really came about as a result of my own struggle as an undergraduate student. I was very taken aback and really kind of hit over the head (laughs) with a ton of bricks, to be honest, with how difficult it was to, to make the transition. I was getting straight A's. I had joined a sorority and made great friends. My family was healthy and happy, but something was missing. I just became very overwhelmed and anxious, depressed, and I just wasn't happy. And 
this really took a big toll on me. And I tried to put up a facade and acted like everything was fine. You would have never known that I was really struggling on the inside. And I felt really fortunate that I had a close relationship with my parents. I was able to share some of these struggles that I was going through. And we jointly decided that it might be best for me to go for some therapy, which I did. And that was great. And that really kind of got me back to baseline, so to speak. But I would say that I was still really just kind of surviving and coasting. And it wasn't until my junior year that I really went from surviving to thriving in college. And I attribute that to that fateful mindfulness class that I I told you about a little bit earlier that I took. And this class completely changed my life and how I related to myself, how I related to the stress that I was going through and my relationships with other people, my relationships with nature, with, with a higher power. And I remember distinctly thinking at the time, wow, I wish I learned these skills earlier in my academic career, I feel like it would have saved me so much struggle and strife. And, you know, as I shared it, it had such a profound impact. It even shaped the trajectory of my immediate career graduating college, but then obviously what I have come to to do now. And I I won't (laughs) take you down my whole professional rabbit hole, so to speak, but I did end up going back to get my master's in psychology and education after I I did that in conjunction while I was working with Canyon Ranch, and then I kind of phased phased out of working at Canyon Ranch. But I went back to get my master's at Columbia University in psychology and education, and I felt really drawn to take a year-long practicum in positive psychology. I don't really know why. I just felt drawn to this particular professor. I had experienced some of his work in the summer session, and now I was choosing a class for the fall. And this particular class would require me to travel back and forth between New York and Arizona, you know, every other month, basically. And it wasn't, you know, I was able to kind of justify the the commitment of that because my family's back in New Jersey. My sister lived in New York City, so I had a place to crash. But I just felt like I needed to take this class. And I am so grateful that I did because I became very fascinated with a subfield of positive psychology known as positive education. And this is really about infusing heart-based skills such as grit and resilience into an academic environment. And I realized through the research that I was doing that most of the efforts in this field were being geared towards K through 12. And mind you, we still have a ways to go, but there were at least some initiatives in that space. And there was virtually nothing being done for college students. And the research that I had just done on this and seeing how many college students were really struggling with their mental health, there has become a mental health crisis on college campuses, and then obviously coming full circle and and coupling that with my own personal experience. And I just knew from the depths of my core that this is what I want to do. I want to provide programs to help college students navigate this challenging time, to give them proactive tools to really be equipped to handle whatever comes up. And so my, you know, I shared this with my professor at Columbia that this is, you know, I, I didn't want to just write my, my dissertation on this, but I also wanted to actually pursue this as a business venture. And I asked him if he had any interest in partnering with me on this. And he shared with me, he politely declined and said that this was not his particular area of expertise or passion, but he knew of the perfect people that it might be. And those were his two um, friends and colleagues over at NYU, Dr. Alan Schlechter and Daniel Lerner. And the, those two individuals taught and still teach the, one of the most popular electives at the NYU campus called the Science of Happiness. And he made an introduction and we hit it off and we decided to bring these programs to college students across the country. 
Wonderful. That was kind of long. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. I love it. So As you can hear, I can talk about this forever. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to ask you, if you are open to that, that what struggles did you have when you were in undergrad? You mentioned yeah. that earlier, that you were going through tough times, to struggle, then you had to, you had to go for therapy. Yeah. You know, it's one of those things where it was, you couldn't, or, you know, I couldn't, I should say, I couldn't pinpoint a specific trigger or something that was gravely wrong or something really bad that happened to me, right? Because as I shared, like from the outside looking in, my life looked great and like I was well adjusted, but, you know, I was staying up later than I ever had before, you know, studying harder than I ever had before, you know, eating more food. And to be candid, you know, I I definitely had my fair share of fun in college and at the start of college and I had put on some weight. And so I didn't really feel like myself and that only made things worse. And so I just wasn't happy. It just, there wasn't anything in particular. And I almost feel like that made it worse because when I looked at my life and I I really didn't have any self-compassion because I just was beating myself up, you know, look at how great everything is is going why why do you feel this way why aren't you happy and and you know it was just kind of that downward spiral yes now fast forward what tools do you provide to college students from their managing stress and improving resilience yeah so i'm really humbled we have partnered with 32 different scholars, psychologists, educators, and experts in the fields of mindfulness, positive psychology, and self-compassion from various institutions across the country who really saw our vision, believed in our mission to provide this type of content to students, and they were willing to lend of their expertise and their time to create videos. Our, our programs are, they can be completed as completely online programs, or they can be completed as kind of a hybrid flip classroom model where a lot of the didactic material is taught via videos and then there is the ability to facilitate discussions with students to create community and go deeper. But it was really important to us to incorporate all three of these fields that I keep mentioning, right? Positive psychology, mindfulness, and self-compassion because we recognize that we are all unique individuals and there is not one tool or tip or practice that's going to resonate with every individual. So our hope is that by offering a broad range of tools and exercises that students will latch on and find the one, two, three, five that resonate with them and will really integrate it into their lives and use it. Could you name some of those tools and exercises? Yeah. So I think a lot of what we do, again, is helping students to connect the material that they're learning in the videos into their own lives. And so all of the exercises that we share are typically rooted in some sort of science and they tie to the video content. So whether we're having students reflect on a gratitude journal or go through something called a stages of change exercise where they have the opportunity to reflect on one aspect that they would like to change, make a positive change towards well-being, whether that's exercise more, get more sleep, meditate, you know, maybe do a social media, you know, disconnecting from social media, what have you, allowing them to focus on and pick one area of change that they would like to to make, right? So we, we have students focus on their identity, right? We have multiple identities. That's part of our diversity, equity, and inclusion module, having students think about their different identities and what does it mean in different settings? What identities and roles do we play depending on the situations that we're in or who, who we're with? Of course, mindfulness and, and allowing students to practice meditating via guided meditation. We give a variety of different kinds, whether it's seated, whether it's walking, mindful eating, we, we share those kinds of tools or allowing students to think about something that they want to have more willpower with 
And we also, again, self-compassion is a big part of our program. So there's a special practice called a self-compassion break. And we teach students how to do that. How to how do you be self-compassionate with yourself or how do you name your your inner critic when it's a so when you can notice when it's arising, you can give it a name. So I know I just rattled off a, a whole bunch, but I think at the end of the day, our greatest desire is to help students make positive changes in their well-being and to find skills and tools that are going to really allow them to be the best versions of themselves and to have steady practices that support their growth and development. Simone, what challenges or struggle do you see or feel while working with college students? Yes, that's a good question. You know, I don't work with students one-on-one, right? So I think I I should clarify that is that we are working with institutions to provide these programs to their students, right? So my my greatest hope would be that like how college students before going to college, they have to take alcohol education training and you know, sexual misconduct training. My hope is they they will also have to take mental well-being training. And that is what we hope to do. And so I think, you know, just from the responses that I get from the institutions that we work with or some of the surveys that we administer, you know, college students put so much pressure on themselves. It's a lot of self-inflicted pressure. And they just have so much on their plates that it can be so overwhelming. And so I think that's one of the hardest things is sometimes the very thing that is going to help them manage their stress, i.e. learning some of these kinds of skills and tools, they can't even think about adding one other thing to their plate if they have to seek it out on their own. And I think that's been one of the biggest challenges that I have had with you know, looking and seeing prior to kind of creating these programs is that there's a lot of wonderful things that college campuses are doing for their students, but they all require students to to go and to seek them out and to do them on their own. And I just feel like we need to be more proactive by, you don't know what you don't know. And so by giving students these tools you know, and putting it kind of really blatantly right in front of their face, right? And recognizing that, again, it's not going to resonate with everybody, but even if it doesn't resonate at that moment, for them to have the suite of skills to refer back to maybe down the road, if we can just plant a seed, I think they'll be way better equipped to to handle these these trials and tribulations. So I don't know if that really answered your question. <laughs> it does. It it can be overwhelming for college students because they already have their studying material. And on top of that, they might have to add mindfulness practices and they are just taking on online course. You know, somebody has to walk through what practices or exercises might resonate with an individual. Exactly. And I think, unfortunately, you know, I'm I'm sure... Well, I don't even need to share this, but now more than ever with everything going on right now, our, our current climate, these practices and these skills and these kinds of trainings, students need these. They, they needed them for a while, but they need them really now more than ever with everything going on. I'm curious to ask you, can your programs, your mindfulness programs be consumed or used by somebody who is not in college, somebody who is an adult? For instance, I'm not in college. Can I use your programs? That's a great question. So the way that we currently have them set up is that, you know, our our programs are typically purchased by an institution or students at an institution. And we did that specifically. So while every single individual, regardless of their age or if they're in college or not in college, could benefit from these practices and learning this material, our programs really were created with college students in mind. All the examples that we give in our programs are geared towards college students. And that was really done intentionally, right? Because I feel like there's a lot of different videos out there on some of the things that we teach. But what differentiates a TED Talk or a YouTube video on just this general topic of mindfulness or positive psychology or willpower or what have you is that 
our experts all gave examples of how this material specifically relates to college students. So they can really, right, we as humans, we learn via storytelling and examples and being able to relate this to ourselves to make meaning. That's how we contextualize things. And so we purposefully embedded examples throughout the entire program and every video, to be honest, that is really geared towards college students. So I would say that, yes, if you actually stripped away the examples that were being provided, anybody at any age could benefit from this material. We just chose to really gear the content mm-hmm. towards college students. Yeah, these practices are common and they can be applied to anybody in any age group. Meditation, exactly. gratitude journaling, visualization, mindful walking, anybody can use it. It's just your programs are custom tailored for college students. Yes. Why do you think focusing on college students' mental health is a must? Oh, because there is a crisis. I mean, if you just, you know, and maybe because I have it pinged, but I mean, it feels like every other day there's a new article coming out that's just talking about the struggles that college students are going through, right? So even recently, there was a uh, study that shared that, you know, 60% of students polled felt like their institutions didn't adequately help them with their mental health. And since the pandemic has started, you know, another poll that was conducted, 80% of students shared that their mental health has gotten worse since COVID-19. They've become more anxious, more depressed, more stressed. And I think that colleges, they have wonderful mental health facilities, but a lot of times those facilities are maxed you know, to capacity in terms of how the capacity of what their practitioners can can take on. A lot of times there's there's wait times. And I think that's a really, on one hand, that shows that there is a decrease in stigma of people getting help. And I'm so happy about that. But on the other hand, it shows that this is something that students want more assistance with and not just want it, they need more assistance with. And I just, I don't know. I just feel like this is a priority and needs to be prioritized just like academic education is. Yes. Simone, I would love to ask you something very personal to you. How do you deal with setbacks and failures now? Mm, That's a great question. So as a recovering perfectionist (laughs) (laughs) who is very uh, accustomed to nitpicking, beating myself up over things. I think something that's really helped me is this mantra of good is good enough. And that doesn't mean settling. That doesn't mean doing something half-assed or subpar. But it means sometimes it's better to release something into the world without revising and revamping and going over and over again and And putting yourself out there because we can spend so much time trying to perfect ourselves or perfect something and then we miss opportunities. And so I think that's been something that's been really a profound learning for me is that, you know, nothing has to be perfect all the time, right? As long as you're giving 100% of your Mm -hmm. effort. And I think in terms of dealing with setbacks and failures is – detaching the failure from me as the individual that was a part of the failure. And so let me kind of like unpack that a little bit. So I think a lot of times when we fail, we blame ourselves or, you know, I think sometimes we shirk responsibility and try to blame all other circumstances or other individuals involved but I think really what I'm trying to, to get at is sometimes recognizing that failure is a natural part of life and we need failure. Without failure, we cannot succeed. We can't grow. If we're not failing, we're stagnant and complacent and we should always be viewing lack of quote unquote failure. And if you could see me, I'm putting air quotes in the air, you know, as, as opportunities for growth, they're, 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 setbacks, but be, you know, having a failure doesn't mean that you are a failure. And I think those are two different things. Do you remember a favorite failure of yours that 
brought something out of you that you learned so much from that. Yeah. And, you know, I want to use the word failure loosely. I I think that the example I'm going to give still relates to that because again, I think it's all about perspective, but I spent several years having my own lifestyle coaching business and I loved what I was doing, but I very quickly realized that it was not what I was meant to be doing as my vocation, as my, my gift to the world. And I so desperately wanted that to be my career path that I, I feel like when I recognized that that wasn't really what I wanted to do and what it wasn't really aligned with my greatest talents and gifts, I really needed to take a step back and recognize I could have viewed that as a failure, right? And, you know, I, I was doing quite well, but I just you know, I decided to abandon ship, so to speak. And I think it's a matter of perspective and how we view it versus I could have viewed that as a failure and, you know, really beat myself up for it. Or I could have viewed it as, okay, I tried something. I put myself out there. It wasn't for me. If I didn't do that, I would have always wondered, you know, I I thought one of the main reasons I left Canyon Ranch was because I thought I wanted to be closer to people's transformation of change, right? I wanted to I was kind of a, there was a a person in between me and that transformation, right? I was empowering others to, to help make the transformation with their clients, so to speak. I was in the operation side of things and I wanted to really give it a go and be the one on the front line working with people. And I realized that my greatest gifts are actually empowering others to do that work, to do that coaching and, and right? You know, I'm not the one teaching my programs to college students. I am empowering others and working with others where their gift and their passion is in teaching. And so I think for me, that was something that I had to reframe that that professional journey was not a failure. It is what led me to what I'm doing now. Thank you for explaining this, by the way. Would you say that you are a messenger? You are not directly teaching to the students, but you are bringing the brains, positive brains, and I should say that the experts in positive psychology, compassion, and mindfulness of space to create those programs and empower college students and others. Absolutely. I would absolutely say that I am a messenger. I am a container to house this information. (laughs) I'm a conduit of this information, right? It's just, I'm not the one that is, is teaching it. And I am, you know, really, I think that's one of the beautiful things is we as individuals all have our gifts, our strengths, and not only that, but the things that light us up and that we love doing. And I know for me, my, what I love doing is I love creating, I love executing, I love organizing, I love leading, I love, you know, delivering, but I like to work with other people who love the act of teaching and who are experts in teaching. So yes, I think that was a very succinct way of putting it is that I am more of a messenger. Yes. And the reason I chose the word messenger because I consider myself as a messenger. I'm not Mm. providing any value or as such, I'm not sharing any practices into this podcast. I'm bringing experts like you to share your expertise with our listeners and with the rest of the world. Yes, exactly. (laughs) We are are very much the same in that. I'm in complete agreement. Got it. So what kind of books would you gift or have you gifted the most? Oh, hands down. I have a whole stash in my in our office <laughs> study. The Untethered Soul by, by Michael Singer. Uh-huh. Michael Singer. Yes. Yeah, so he goes by, by Mickey. And I only know that because he opened up a meditation space called the Temple of the Universe in Gainesville, Florida, where I went to school. And I had to read his book, The Untethered Soul, as a required reading for one of my spirituality and health classes that I took. And he came to speak to that class. And I just 
absolutely loved, still to this day, I will go back and reread that book from time to time or little excerpts from it because I felt like he conveyed this information in such a succinct way of how to be present and how to be an observer and a participant in life. And this book has been recommended by many of our podcast guests. Really? Yes. Well, it just goes to show what an, an amazing individual Nikki Singer is. And he's just such, he really walks the talk. Yes, for sure. So Simone, do you have any closing thoughts, any, anything that you would like to share with our listeners? I think if there's one thing that I can share to take away is finding something small to do on a daily basis that lights you up, that makes you happy, that brings peace, that brings some sense of joy in your life, no matter how busy things get, right? It's so easy to say, I don't have time for that, right? But if we shift it and say, well, I don't make time for that, those are two different things. And I think that it is so important. So many of us give, give, give to others. We give to our jobs. We just are giving beings. And I think (laughs) sometimes we need to do less and be more. And that includes taking a moment for ourselves every day. I love the term you used giving beings yeah we human beings are giving beings Mm -hmm. so to follow up on this thing i would love to ask you what is that one thing or a small thing that gives you the joy most joy every day in your life well right now hands down it's providing meaningful work and feeling like i am living out my passion and my purpose with respect to the programs that we offer to college students i could talk about this all day, every day. I can eat, breathe, sleep this. And I know from a work-life balance perspective, that sounds like it could not be healthy, but I'm not always you know, connected to the, the computer or anything like that. But just feeling like I am in such alignment with my professional path and my personal path. So I think that was like a, a larger thing. It's not like a little minor thing that I I do every day, but it's just, that is for me right now, it's all consuming in a very positive way. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you, Simone. And where can our listeners find you online? Yes. So if you're interested in learning more about the programs that we provide to college students, please visit www.youthrive.com education.com and the U is like the letter U, not Y-O-U. So www.youthriveeducation.com. I'd love to connect on LinkedIn, Simone Figueroa. And you can email me as well, Simone at youthriveeducation.com. Thank you so much, Simone. It was wonderful. So wonderful talking to you. I so enjoyed my time. This was the highlight of my day. Thank you for creating a space for us to discuss and have a very fruitful conversation around meaningful work that I know you and I both are very passionate about. Thanks again. Thanks, Nishant. Thank you for listening to this podcast episode today. If you did enjoy this, please subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts or you can visit https colon slash slash nishangarg.me n-i-s-h-a-n-t-g-a-r-g dot me you can also share this episode with your loved ones to help them live a fulfilled life you are not alone in this journey we all struggle in life there is no shame in talking about it i go through my highs and lows i get depressed and these practices help me in living a resilient life you can also do this you got this don't judge yourself you are doing the best you can and thank you so much again. Okay.